Game Cool Books, Episode 45, The Heart of Everything. It's a shorter chapter, and despite my title for the episode, taken from something Mrs. Coulter says in the course of her conversation with Lord Boreal, which occupies many of its pages, theft is a little past the midway point of the book, and thus, depending on how you measure it, a little past the midway the trilogy. It's very much of a piece with the previous two chapters arc, recovering the alethiometer which was lost by means of the knife which was gained. In this recovery, there is a foreshadowing of the much more fundamental transformation that Lyra's reading of the instrument will undergo at the conclusion of the third book, but we'll have to revisit that when we get to it. The chapter opens with a beat of recovery and rest for Will and Lyra. Practical concern of propriety and cleanliness, which we saw with Lyra's shopping trip before Will took her through to his world, gets modified here. In the exigency of his wounds and bloody clothing, the time for feeling guilt was over. Which isn't to say that morality is relative, but that the feeling of guilt is driven out by the urgent need for refreshment. Lyra's own guilt about the events she witnessed in the alley with Tulio, Angelica, and Paolo remains present in her mind as she looks around carefully. It's normally Will's M.O., but he's in no state to care. His washing is depicted with little of the tenderness we saw in the scene with Roger at Lord Asriel's. It's simply clinical. No cuts could be cleaner. And yet it does point up the connection between the physical and mental and emotional state of the sufferer in a curious echo of the cooperation among these levels requisite for the knife's subtle edge to work. Here, Will breathes deeply until his heart beat and the bleeding of his stumps seem to slow, calming himself. There's no mention of an authority descending as such, but the author is somewhat more present more conspicuous than usual in his notable repetition of the word blood in these sentences. There are still limits to Will's control as his tears flow when Lyra fastens his bandage as tight as she can, but she forbears commenting kindly. Something momentous has shifted in their relationship since the ordeal in the Tower of the Angels. If we had to choose a single moment for the shift, be difficult to pick between Pan's gentle touch and Lyra's deft instruction in the poetics of consciousness. But somewhere along the line, Will has made up his mind to trust her fully, for he lets her into a secret, the letters from his father. He insists she can read them. You can read them. It's as if giving us permission as well to go back over them the way he already has, to allow us to read them at our leisure and muse on their meaning. Does she, I wonder? I don't think we ever find out for sure, but it's interesting, quite poignant, to imagine what Lyra might have felt as she read the letters which meant so much to her friend. The narrative passes over this, and over the rest of the day, Will sleeps, the cat recovering from her own wounds on the bed beside him. Later, the tale picks up with all of them, Lyra, Pan, Will, and the cat, preparing for the heist. The Oxford and Shigatsi sides have a sort of correspondence here that's more obvious than that of the tower and the graveyard, but something more along the lines of the palm and hornbeam trees. Where Sir Charles's stately house is in Will's world, a luxurious villa occupies the other. Their movements here have been slow, cutting through frequently to check, moving in the world where they used to feel safe. The questionable status of Chigatsi is recalled in the way Will thinks the cat seems to think it's safe wherever they were. That safety is not in a particular place, but in the relationships among the people there and the other creatures. He has to focus on the business at hand, but we are perhaps not so surprised when the cat plays a crucial role in the events to come. 
The Will's command of the knife is getting better with all the practice cutting through and closing up windows. His wound is getting worse. The pain, almost the mere image of his competence. The scenery here, the lights on in the garden, the dark study, suggest a kind of mixture of the glare of Bolvanger lights and the comfort of Lyra's Jordan. Once more, Will and Lyra are in the place of intruders, but now it is so as to get back what is rightfully theirs. They cooperate to cut through the bars of the fence, and then Will lays out the choreography of the movements which we'll do our best to follow. Thinking outside the box a little, they'll be using not one, but two simultaneous windows, so that Lyra and Pan as an owl can keep watch outside the house, while Will takes the alethiometer from its case in the study, and they all meet up together in the safety of Chigatsi, where he'll close both windows behind them. In passing, we might note that while he's taken a degree of sophistication with the knife to be able to come up with and essentially execute such a skillful plan, neither Will nor Lyra, for that matter, seem to ask themselves why he is so far only cut between these two worlds, back and forth, rather than into one of the other infinitude of possible universes. It's a topic which will be taken up somewhat later, but for now, it's part of that wood of his invented worlds, which Pullman studiously avoids to keep to the path of his story. Will's memorizing of distance and direction, as much as Lyra's feeling the tiny movements in the night around her, both recall aspects of Ruta Scotti's wondrous flight. The exquisite descriptor mullioned is deployed to evoke the gothic shape of the study windows, or simply for the rich sound of the word itself. For the impatient minutes she has to wait while Will is gone, Lyra chases question after question around in her mind. It's as if her inability to ask the alethiometer what she wants to know is being dramatized. Into this breaks the quiet sound of the car pulling up the drive out front. Sir Charles returning home. Still more suspensefully, Pan can see there's someone with him, and Lyra hurries after so they can both get close enough to see. Ensconced in the laurel, she sees who it is and feels it in her heart, the worst blow since Bolvanger, where Mrs. Coulter, for it is she, paradoxically enough, saved her. At this point, the narrative breaks off, and we backtrack to follow Will's progress. From feeling exposed at the bright villa, he makes his way through with a series of attempts, peering through into Sir Charles's empty house, eventually finding the exact spot where the alethiometer should be on its case but there's nothing there. Whatever the bulky instrument with the brass rings above it is supposed to be, a sextant or astrolabe, either would look good next to the alethiometer. That was his landmark, but the space where it was earlier that day is empty. So much for the plan. From behind the sofa, he opens a window big enough for him to come through fully for a brief and futile search what with the cards to fancy openings and the interminable drawers and other hiding places he would have to look through. But then the crunch of tires outside catches us up back to where his time and Lyra's are parallel, and with it, her running footsteps. Each has bad news for the other, setting up a curious connection between Lyra's alethiometer, he's got it with him, and her mother. She's with him. And at last, seeing the two of them together, a piece of knowledge comes through for her. She knows who he is, Lord Boreal, for she last saw them both together 
the night of the cocktail party. Indeed, he knew who she was all the time, as she fears. The parallels between worlds and between characters is drawn out in a tangible way now. Sorry, I want to stay with you, she whispered. I want to hear what they say. Hush now, because he could hear voices in the hall. The two of them were close enough to touch. Will in his world, she in Shitagatsi. And seeing his trailing bandage, Lara tapped him on the arm and mimed, tying it up again. As I pointed out last time, there's a deeper significance just below the surface of this image, but the main thing it means for now is that Lyra once more tightens Will's bandage for him so he can be ready to act. What else but Tokai to sip on? Not poison this time. There's an extended dialogue that follows between the adults. Marisa and Carlo are not only on first name basis, but also lovers, we know, from Asriel's parting words. There's a definite undercurrent of sexual tension to their conversation in the study. Boreal, the host, thinks he has the upper hand, but he may well be overplaying it, calling Lyra a repellent brat, and then flattering her mother to make up for it, only to run into a warning tone from his guest. Even Will is seduced at once by Mrs. Coulter's voice. Oh. Sorry. I want to stay with you, she whispered. I want to hear what they say. Hush now, because he could hear voices in the hall. The two of them were close enough to touch. Will in his world, she in Shitagatsi. And seeing his trailing bandage, Lara tapped him on the arm and mimed, tying it up again. As I pointed out last time, there's a deeper significance just below the surface of this image, but the main thing it means for now is that Lyra once more tightens Will's bandage for him so he can be ready to act. What else but Tokai to sip on? Not poison this time. There's an extended dialogue that follows between the adults. Marisa and Carlo are not only on first name basis, but also lovers, we know, from Asriel's parting words. There's a definite undercurrent of sexual tension to their conversation in the study. Boreal, the host, thinks he has the upper hand, but he may well be overplaying it, calling Lyra a repellent brat, and then flattering her mother to make up for it, only to run into a warning tone from his guest. Even Will is seduced at once by Mrs. Coulter's voice. Her voice was intoxicating, soothing, sweet, musical, and young, too. He longed to know what she looked like, because Lyra had never described her. The face that went with this voice must be remarkable. Wanting to see her, even though it would certainly jeopardize his main objective, getting the alethiometer, is a problem that will come back to cause Will trouble in the future, too. Before that alethiometer makes an appearance this time, we retread further through the plot, hearing what Azrael is up to, gathering his army to complete the war fought in heaven. How medieval, Carlo Bolriol quips, which seems mostly a comment on the crudeness of this ambition. But then he immediately plays on the historical sense. 
conceding that Lord Azrael has modern capabilities. The pole blasted, which Lee had heard discussed in more theoretical terms, suggests movements of the magnetic pole in the past may have had similar causes. And the way the disturbances resonate across the worlds introduces that word resonate, which we'll see whole new technologies develop around. The lodestone resonator and the bomb in the third book. This world is what Mrs. Coulter asks about next. She seems a subject to wonder at it as her daughter. Astonishingly, Lord Boreal claims to know of not one or two windows, but a dozen or so. And following Lord Asriel's great bridge or breach in the north, that the places they open into have shifted. Imagine his surprise to find Mrs. Coulter nearby one, he says. Again, that sense that a place is partly about the people in it. He calls this providence, maybe with similar irony to his use of medieval earlier. And he goes on to call Jitagatsi and its world a sort of crossroads, now bypassed, at least in some places, by the shift. As to what makes it dangerous, the specters, we may remember they too have changed, growing vastly in numbers since the breach. If Boreal's aware of this, he doesn't mention it. The hint he does give, that the specters attack only adults, but ignore children, Mrs. Coulter seizes on at once. What? I must know about this, Carlo. This is at the heart of everything, this difference between children and adults. It contains the whole mystery of dust. This is why I must find the child. She has the answer somehow, and I must have it. Just as the witches picked up on this detail out of Joachim Lorenz's story, and they, after all, are the ones who know the name for her daughter, which she sought through torturing one, and now seems intent on seeking directly by trying to find Lyra herself. As Boreal says, this instrument will bring her there, although not knowing, as we do, that she and Will are there already. He muses then on Mrs. Coulter's curious bodyguards. In much the same fashion as he changed the topic of conversation in the car that day, asking about her demon. They're the zombies we heard about in Trollesund, adults with no demons. He proposes an experiment to see how they and the specters might interact. If his hunch is correct, and we'll see that it is, and more than he bargained for, Two of them may be able to travel in that world after all. He winds up. Dust, children, specters, demons, intercision. Yes, it might very well work. Have some more wine. The ponderous thematic vocabulary trailing off like that happens also at the end of the cocktail party. Although then, it was a narrative effect, imitating Lyra's own overtaxed attention to a jumbled conversation she didn't fully understand. Here, it seems to be a bit of conversational theatricality put on by Boreal. Mrs. Coulter indulges him, asking if this is where he came when they're set in their world, thought he was in Brazil or the Indies. It's at once closer than and infinitely further from either. And here he soon made his way among the powerful of this world, given his experience on the Council of State at home. As a spy, he saw firsthand the Cold War with the Soviet Union. What's Muscovy to her? 
In brief, the narrator moves the camera to her eyes fixed on him. So we can see something that neither Will nor Lyra can, unless in imagination. With their interest in fundamental physics, the superpowers began investigating other worlds. Not through the space race or Star Wars, but the otherworldly properties of what they call dark matter, dust. Whether he was responsible for them nearly catching Lyra there or not, Oriel shows he is well aware of Dr. Malone's team working on that research. And then he even mentions that a man disappeared through a doorway. It's the only one they know about. While they've been looking for this man since the polar disturbance, he hasn't told them what he knows. And perhaps he has not put together what Will does at once, of course, that this man he's talking about is Will's own father. At last, the conversation begins to wrap up, heightening the tension for us through Will's attention to the shadow prowling the room and his realization of what it must be. The shadow fell still. The creature that was the source of it must have been perched on the back of Mrs. Coulter's chair because the light streaming over it threw its shadow clearly on the wall. And the moment it stopped, he realized it was the woman's demon, a crouching monkey, turning its head this way and that, searching for something. That image of the shadow on the wall looks like a clear reference to Dr. Malone's and thus Plato's cave. Into that stillness, those two things, the appearance of the alethiometer and the relationship between Mrs. Coulter and the shadow of her demon are joined. Lyra's intake of breath nearly gives them away, but Will gives her the task which will allow them to complete the heist. She's to throw stones against the window, as if recalling her tapping against the glass that morning she left Jordan so long ago. And Mrs. Coulter picks up on this. She reflects that the master was foolish for trusting her with the instrument. The years of study in order to learn to read it, of course, do still await Lyra. That Boreal saw her with it in the museum doesn't seem to mean that she already knows how to read it. He is correct, anyhow, about her having found a doorway. And Boreal frankly tells his guest that he stole the alethiometer. In his words, there's no need to be coy, they're both grown up. Even when he mentions her coming to see him once already, the nerve it must have taken her, still he does not mention Will. Oriole's purpose, as he tells it, has to do with this trade he seems confident on being able to make. Though, according to Paradisi, there's no trade at all, but only a deception. Whether Will expects it or not, Lyra does more than make a noise with the stone she throws. It smashes the window, as followed by more. At once, Will snatches the alethiometer from the table and sets to closing the window from the Chitgatsi side. And in this moment, from being the shadow, the golden monkey very nearly becomes like the specters. The narration is immediate, so we might not notice it. But this is just what it suggests. We're told Will is conscious all the time. Um, all the time that only feet away there was a horrible danger. Um, then came a screech, not human, not animal, but worse than either. And he knew it was that loathsome monkey by that time, he'd gotten most of the window closed, but there was still a small gap at the level of his chest. And then he leaped back because into that gap came a small furry golden hand with black fingernails and then a face, a nightmare face. The golden monkey's teeth were bared, his eyes glaring, 
and such a concentrated malevolence blazed from him that Will felt it almost like a spear. But like the specters, the monkey is afraid of the knife, and that gives Will time to close. That physical force of emotion recurs there, like Lyra had sensed in Angelica's glance, or from Mrs. Coulter before, and it's something the demons have manifested all along. Lyra used her skill at throwing physical objects here once more to great effect, but she left herself stranded, away from the window in the garden, somewhere in the holly and laurel. And Boreal, armed with a much more deadly pistol, uh, stalking her out there. Debating how to rescue her, Will is quick to notice Mrs. Coulter's looks. The woman herself was beautiful. Will saw that with a shock. Lovely in the moonlight, her brilliant dark eyes wide with enchantment, her slender shape light and graceful. But as she snapped her fingers, the monkey stopped at once and leaped up into her arms, and he saw that the sweet-faced woman and the evil monkey were one being. With Lord Boreal disengaging the safety on his gun, the tabby cat at that moment leaps out to save the day. The reaction is astonishment, though maybe not so much for the reader, who should suspect that the cat would be included for some reason. And the parallel to Moxie's intervention at the start of the book is driven home as Will reflects on it once they're through. The narration here with its series of ands throughout the crisis finally slows down to bathe us in silver. And wrapped up in Will's hope that the cat is all right and is thinking about Moxie, is thus his thinking about home, about his mother. Lyra, no less astonished than Will, thought she was his demon, that cat, and wondering about the reciprocity of their rescues of one another. That reminds me of Will's imaginary adventures with his father, rescuing one another. We might also remember the angels, Giacomo Paradisi, intuited or believed, were accompanying Will and Lyra. Moving into the villa to lie on the beds rather than the wet grass, to scrounge up some food and drink, coffee and omelets, it seems they're finally safe. Lyra promises to do nothing now except help Will find his father. She helped him up and they walked slowly through the garden toward the great white gleaming house under the moon. Thanks for listening.